Well, good morning. Good morning. All right, that's, that's good. I'm, I'm south side of Chicago. You're going to have to be ready to run with me here for a bit. Dr. York, thank you. And uh, Al Moeller, I see he's looking over us, over my right shoulder. <laughs> Appreciate the invitation. I know that you're out of town speaking today, but uh, if those eyes start to move, I'll realize that uh, you're not quite happy with what's taking place. I also realize we've got uh, E.Y. Mullins on the other wall, so I'm feeling a little hemmed in uh, as they, they watch over us. I've been excited about the opportunity to come and uh, looking forward to our time. I've thought about uh, something here as I get this up and going. About what to uh, do while with you, and I really wanted to just put a banner over this persuasive preaching. You'll realize I, I don't, uh, my penmanship isn't that great. Um, I was an athlete, and so uh, I never really learned how to spell very well. But I've realized if I run those words along, you think I know what, what I'm doing. <laughs> so persuasive preaching. And for that, I'm going to take uh, St. Augustine's opening line in Book 4 of On Christian Doctrine as my cue. It's one of the earliest short, brief manuals on what it takes to preach. This is what he writes. There are two things upon which all interpretation of Scripture depends. The process of discovering what we need to learn and the process of presenting what we have learned. I even appreciated the way my volume spelled the word learnt, L-E-A-R-N-T, learnt. The process of discovering what we need to learn from the text, the process of presenting that which we have learnt. In one sense, then, I want to say that the preacher really, in his preparation, is always moving toward the biblical text, but at some point in his preparation process, he has discovered what he needs to learn. And hopefully he's got it right. And then there comes that moment in the week where he now faces today and he has to enter into the process of presenting that which he's learned. You could almost put it in the sense of that moment in your week where you're trying to sort out how do I get this across. The three lectures that I'll be doing this week really pivot on this second part. I'll leave it to your professors to give you the exegetical process, the theological reflection, the gospel opportunities. But I want to talk a little bit this week about that moment in your ministry where you have to now communicate that which you have studied for the week. In one sense, you could say that your work in preaching moves from the biblical text to its historical context to them and to then, the first audience, which is really an engagement in exegesis. But then you have to sort out how that text that you're getting ready to preach this week actually relates to the cross. This, of course, requires theological reflection, both biblical theology, systematic theology. You might be making use of historical theology, but you're you're meditating on your text and its proper organic relationship to the death and resurrection of Christ. And only after that work is done do you begin to turn yourself home to have a word for today. The process of discovering what you need to learn are these first two legs of the journey. The process of presenting that which you've learned is the last leg of the journey. Often overlooked. In fact, many people think they're ready to preach simply because they've done the first two. There's a number of things that I think go into this part of it. Why don't you talk to the man next to you? What goes in to presenting that which you have learned? What do you have to do at this leg of your preparation? Just mention to the guy next to you or the man or woman two or three things that are necessary engagements on this leg of the journey. Yes, you have to talk in this group today. I know you came to listen, but you're going to be involved. All 
right, let's just have a four or five individuals just call it out. One thing that came to your mind, this leg of the journey involves what? Audience. audience. Yep, it's going to involve my audience. I've got to consider the ones to whom I'm speaking. Um, if, if I was speaking today to high school students, this talk would look very different. If I'm, if I'm speaking to a business group, you have to actually, the only people that matter on the talk you're delivering are the ones that are in front of you. And so the consideration of this text in light of those to whom I'm speaking is an essential aspect. Somebody give me another thing. Application. Application. Um, what is this word going to actually do in regard to framing in their life, their belief, their conduct? Yeah, absolutely. Great one. And notice you've got two A's there. There might be a couple more A's. Anybody else? Yeah. Contextualization. Contextualization is critical. So you're actually moving from the biblical text and its original context and the context in redemptive history, but at some point you're actually considering the context in, into which this word is coming. Yeah, great one. Somebody else? Illustration. Illustration. And to keep it in an A context, I'll just call it adornment. What, what, what are the things that are adorning your message that are enforcing and reinforcing your, um, your message? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? One more? Delivery. What was that? Delivery. delivery itself? Yeah. In fact, the aspect of delivery would be the arrangement of your message. Because I like A's today. We're, I never got A's in school, so I'm going to use a lot of them now. I want to pick up three things on this line this week. I want to devote this talk to something called the argument, something we haven't mentioned yet. You have to make an argument. This afternoon, should you desire to come back, we're going to talk about arrangement. The argument of your message, the arrangement of your material, and then tomorrow I'm, I'm, I'm changing gears. Once I got here last night, I looked to see uh, that the last lectures on preaching for the Mullins lectures were delivered here a couple of years ago, and one of your own preaching professors gave them and uh, had been at Dallas at the time. You all know who I'm speaking of, and he had done a lot on application, so I'm figuring I'm just going to do ethos. So let's spend the next 35 minutes on argument. The persuasive preacher makes an argument. Uh, I've, I've got a picture for this. Um, this one hangs in the, uh, I'm thinking all my art must have hung in the contemporary wing of the museum. I'm not very good at realism. Yeah, why don't you tell the person next to you, what is that? Go ahead, just tell them, give them a good run. This is the image that stands for argument. Anybody? <laughs> You're a quiet bunch. There is coffee in the back corner. Yeah. A burning log. That's a great thought. Uh, no, it's not. Actually, this is Rodin's The Thinker. Can you see it now? Come on now. This, all right, hold on. Before I know you're going to want this, so let's get this right here right now. That's a copyright. Hey, you laugh, but some of my little illustrations are actually published, so you know what am I going to say? At any rate, somebody might lot this one day. Rodin's The Thinker, the bronze sculpture in Paris, the man who sits on a rock, one hand on his chin. See, this is the elbow there. This is his, this is his face up here, his back here. Now, now you're there, correct? Rodin's The Thinker. He's deep in thought. The work was based on Dante's Divine Comedy. It was commissioned for the doorway surround at the gates of hell. We don't really know who Rodin had in mind with this. It could have been one of two people, the poet in the book who actually makes the argument and leaves the listener or the reader at the doorway to the gates of hell. And in one sense, then, this could be the, 
the artist, him, uh, the poet himself, who's fashioned the argument that was to be read. Or it could be the listener. It could be the audience. It could be the reader of the work who's now been left with the argument and has to determine for himself the implications of it all as he sits before the doorway and the gates of hell. That's the picture. What's the principle? The principle is every preacher must become like Rodin's The Thinker. At some point in your week, you have to do the hard work of fashioning an argument that will lead the listener to a point of determination and act of the will. You have to make an argument. And in one sense then, in a nutshell, I've begun to think that all preaching is persuasion. Christianity is not content merely to state things or to be a part of the conversation. We're actually trying to persuade people. And persuasion requires the making of an argument that's rational, reasonable, accessible, delightful. If I had a proof text, I'd turn to uh, Acts 26. Why don't you do that now on your phone or if not on your phone, maybe you actually have a Bible. I'm guessing that at Southern, there are some people that still carry Bibles. You know, a phone is a phone, a Bible is a Bible, and I like the Bible. 26, 24 to 29, one of you read it out loud to the person next to you, and the other just make the observation on preaching and its relationship to persuasion. Acts 26, 24 to 29, we should hear many voices. One reads it out loud. The other makes the observations on the relationship between preaching and persuasion. Give it a run. Yeah, there it is, right? It's, it's not too difficult to see the observations. Paul is using, verse 25, true and rational words. Plausible, you might say. Not merely emotional. Not merely uh, an evocative appeal. He's saying true and rational words about things known on the basis of his own having been persuaded which again gets to the ethos of the preacher. Very difficult to persuade someone of that which you do not believe. But then when he's asked the question in 28, would you persuade me? His answer is clear. Whether short or long, I would to God, and not only you, but to all who hear me this day. That has to be in the mind and heart of the preacher as he speaks to those in front of him. Would to God, whether it's a short sermon today or a long one, which by the way, we'll get to later, what, what's the right length for sermons? You'll have to come back on those kinds of things, but whether it's a short or long word, I would, and not only you, but everyone else who hears me, he is convinced that the spoken word has the persuasive purpose of convincing. Cicero then put it this way, in regard to successful oratory, three things in a sense would be needed for it to be successful. It must instruct, anybody know the next one? It must delight or inspire, it must be pleasant, and then it must move. Now by move, 
Most ministers in North America today think in emotional terms. I, I want to move you. And so they get all hyped up and they get all this passion going because they think that passion is actually moving the person. And whether or not their words are rational or true or reasonable or connected to the text, for, for them doesn't really matter. And that's not what Cicero meant. What he meant by move was conquest. I want to conquer the mind. I want to. Now, think about these three words in regard to preaching. We normally think that preaching is certainly to instruct people. But did you know that your preaching is to move from instruction to a way in which it delights the listener? And do you know that both of these are actually moving toward a destination where you move them and conquer the will? That's what preaching is doing. By nature, it must be doing, unless you're simply trying to say, I'd just like to talk to you today and tell you a little bit about what the Bible has to say. Think of it in, uh, not Ciceronian terms, but think of it in Augustine, because he riffs on this. He borrows those three, and he has different words that he puts on it. Successful oratory, something that you learn, something that is pleasant or you please, and then he has this wonderful phrase, the outcome of the message is to bring to obedience. Bring to obedience. Do you ever think that that's what your preaching is trying to do? It's not merely to let people know some certain things about the Bible or the text. It's to bring the listener to obedience. Dabney uh, puts it this way, to produce a practical determination of the will. All preaching is out to produce a practical determination of the will. That is the goal of preaching, or at least in the sense of making your argument. So let's define argument. We've been at this long enough. We ought to define the terms. Define argument. I'm going to put it to you this way. It's the one thing you are dead set on convincing your listener of from this sermon and the considerations that prove it. Let me say it again. It's the one thing you are dead set on convincing your listener of in this sermon and the considerations that prove it. Or, if you don't like those, it's the one thing you're out to persuade them of and the points that establish it. In one sense, then, your sermon from your first sentence until your last is the argument. But the question is, do you really know by Friday? morning what the one thing is that you're out to convince your listener of. If somebody met you in the church hallway Friday morning, pastor, what are we doing this week? Well, we're doing Ruth 3. Oh, great. Ruth 3. What a wonderful story. Uh, what, what, what are we in for? Well, we're, we're really in for the sense that, uh, you know, Boaz had the power to redeem. Great. Can't wait to see you. Not actually realizing, though, that by Friday morning, you as the preacher were only still facing the text. You, you, were, you were defining what was going to take place on Sunday simply in terms of the explanation of the text. Boaz has the power to redeem. You haven't yet done the hard Rodan thinker work of fashioning that emphasis and the shape of that chapter to the listeners that will be before you that week. I just preached this text uh, last week, and I wrestled with this and wrestled with it because it was clear to me in the narrative that what we saw in Naomi's desire to, to seek rest for Ruth was that Naomi and Ruth, the rest they needed, Boaz had the power to produce. But the question in the pulpit is, so what? For you, for me, until I could actually get myself to consider that the rest and redemption that you and I need, Jesus has been given on the basis of his resurrection the power to secure it. Now, now I'm moving toward you, not merely the biblical text. And this is, has to take place in the making of an argument. That said, you're now going to stand in the pulpit, and every Friday morning you should know what is the one thing I'm dead set on convincing my listener of this week, which is different than what's the big idea of my text. 
well, we ought to qualify this intention to persuade as though the orator is up to doing all of this. Talk to the person next to you. How would you qualify this persuasive intent? I mean, think of even Aristotle. He said that if you possess, if a speaker possesses good sense, virtue, goodwill, if he appears to possess good sense, virtue, and goodwill, he will of necessity persuade his listener. Ah, uh, that's Greco-Roman orator. How would you want to qualify what I've said so far on persuasion? You would want to say, yes, but what? on the things that I've shared with you at this point. Why don't you come up with a couple with the person next to you. Qualify for the preacher this goal of persuasion. Perhaps something concerns you with what I've said to this point. Anybody? Yeah. Yes, but it has to be tethered to the text. It's great. It's great. So what, what he's saying is, okay, it's good, but um, your persuasive goal has to be tethered, and that's just a wonderful word. Uh, I'm sure it's misspelled here, but it's a wonderful word nonetheless. It must be tethered to the text. Um, let, let's just... Let's just sit down on that for a couple seconds. The, one of the distinctions between Greco-Roman rhetoric and what you and I are asked to do by God is that they, they fashioned arguments out of their own mind. <laughs> they weren't working from text to today. Uh, so they, they, were, they were fashioning arguments out of their own mind. You, you don't have that ability. You, you actually, you and I have to fashion arguments that are tethered to the text in front of us. And so where you lose that, uh, you are really in trouble on persuasive preaching. And uh, in one sense, then, you become one of the things that I, I sometimes like to think of as this. Why don't you just tell the guy next to you, any idea what that is? I really wish you chattered more here. You. Your professors must have complete command in the classroom. They never give you a word in edgewise. No, that's not Dave Helm in the shower this morning uh, in room 2020 in the wonderful Legacy Suite. That is what I call the inebriated preacher. The preacher who uses the Bible the way a drunk uses a lamp post, more for support than illumination. Oh. I'm here now. I'm here. Chicago has arrived. The preacher <laughs> who uses the Bible the way a drunk uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. He's not tethered to the text. He's not standing underneath the text and illuminating what, according to the Holy Spirit, this text has in this place. He's deciding he can make an argument that's unrelated to it. And so he just leans on the Bible to do what he wants. If you do that, you're not, you're not an expositor. You might be a great American preacher, but you're not an expositor. So let's do it again. Another qualification. What is that? I can't understand exactly what you're saying. Relevant. I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, qualifying it, it has to be relevant. But it has to be relevant in terms of not only the text, but those to whom I'm speaking. Great. Anything else? Yep. Come on. This is a man that's taken systematic theology somewhere. 
hey, I can do all my best job at trying to persuade people, but I have to recognize that my wonderful arguments are not going to be persuasive if the Holy Spirit isn't actually at work. Um, so we don't want to think that just because I do these things and put in the hard work week by week, I'm necessarily going to convince my listener. In fact, the Bible tells me very clearly, I'm not winning a universal hearing. Even Paul, who did true and rational words, when he did the Areopagus thing, what was their word on him? He's a babbler. He picks up a thought here. He picks up. So Paul, according to many who heard him, thought, this guy didn't make any sense. So yes, the Holy Spirit has to be operative. All these things are good, right qualifications that I wanted to concede. I want to get that out there, lest you think I'm saying something I'm not. But given that, your job is to take the argument of the text and modify it for the audience to whom you speak. Not simply a recapitulation. Your job isn't simply to recapitulate everything you learned about the text this week. To make an argument, in one sense, you don't make them up, you take them up. You don't create them. Rather, you, in a sense, recast them. Your, your text has already made an argument to the first readers. But your sermon now must shape that argument for your listeners. Three qualities necessary for it. Three things necessary for your argument. Why don't you tell the person next to you what they are? What is necessary for a good argument? Go for it. Necessary elements for an effective argument. All right, somebody got one? Got to be true. Excellent. You, it has to be true. It has to be truth embodied in the mind of one who believes it. So you're talking about, in a sense, ethos. We'll get to that in the third lecture, or ethos, just depends on. I suppose it's ethos if you go back and they tell you how to read the Greek and all that, but I've always called it ethos, and I'm not going to change now. I'm a grandpa. I can do what I want, but at any rate, <laughs> ethos. Somebody give me another thing. Yeah. Val Did you say validity? What do you mean by validity? Okay, okay. Yeah, the syllogism has to be valid. Yeah, so there's, there's a sense where it's actually what the, the ancients are going to cause, plausibility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cicero puts it this way. These are the three from the old grand master. Brevity. Clarity, which some of there's overlap with what I'm hearing from you, and plausibility. Your argument has to have all three. Brevity. I love doing brevity to a bunch of Baptists. <laughs> I'm joking, just trying to keep you awake. What do we mean by brevity? Cicero put it this way. If we carry our argument forward, not to the furthermost point, but to the point to which we need to go. If we use no digressions and do not wander from the account we've undertaken to set forth. Oh, this is brilliant. That you're, you're carrying something forward, not to the furthermost point. You're not heaping up and heaping up and piling on 
No, you, you carry something forward to the point in which you need to go with no digressions. Every time you do a digression, you actually take people away from your argument and you, 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 put your, you hinder your ability to be successful. So every time you see some guy do this and he comes out to the side, he goes, you know, thinks he's like bringing himself to you, he's actually pulling everybody away from what the argument's doing. And therefore, he's hindering his ability to plant the truths of this text in them. You know, I know this isn't uh, one of the main points, but this text got me thinking this week about, you know, my, my dog and whether I should go to the church in Hyde Park to have her blessed on uh, last Sunday when they were blessing the dog. And, the, and you think, oh, you're losing yourself. Brevity is not how long you preach. It's that everything that doesn't relate to my argument is gone. I don't, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to be in shape in the pulpit. Quintilian put, our definition of brevity, however, is not saying less than one went off to say, but not saying more. Not saying more. Our arguments would be stronger and tighter with brevity. Clarity. What do we mean by clarity? Well, um, I, I think it's pretty self-evident. But Quintilian put it, a narrative will be clear and lucid first if it is set out in normal but expressive words. Normal words. The language of the audience to whom I'm speaking. You get all up and highfalutin and technical. The, the simpler your language, the more effective you'll be. Um, clarity is there. Don't, don't do things that aren't natural to you. Um, well, in one sense, don't be stupid. You know, don't. Don't act like you're an expert because you found some great illustration about how the planets work. Meanwhile, you know, you failed all that planetary stuff in eighth grade. Planetary. See, there's a whole word there I don't even know. Don't, don't act like, you know, I was, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about DNA, you know, the, whatever this curving thing is. If you don't know anything about it, then make sure you say something like, you know, I, I, really, I really don't know what this is about, but it seems to me that if that's true, if what I've read is true, then this, all of a sudden, your clarity is in front of them. Plausibility. Plausibility. If it answers the requirements of the usual, the expected, the natural, then truth without it cannot gain credence. If you have a preacher's voice versus your voice, you are undercutting plausibility because it's affective. I mean, if I got it in here and, you know, I've, I've heard it, right? In fact, we've all done it, probably. You know, I want to talk today about God. <laughs> you're, not, you're not helping yourself. We need you. We need all of you. You need to be all of you but you do not need to be somebody else. And your argument has to be plausible, not merely emotional. It has to be rational. All these things are essential. Let's see if we can spend the next few minutes putting it into practice. Let's take a look at a couple sample texts in Acts. I'm going to Acts, and let's go to Acts 10, because there are two distinct passages which by way of content almost mirror one another and therefore, by way of sermons, are often taken together. And the argument is simply, it's in here two times. So this is very important. But I'm not quite so sure. You'll know Acts 10, very familiar. The first one is Peter and Cornelius. The second movement is the conversion of Cornelius under the preaching of Peter. And the third one is a recapitulation, at least in form, of what was the first one. But I'm convinced that the first sermon and the third sermon ought to have a very different 
argument, a very different thing I'm trying to convince my listener of. So let's do this together. Take a look at Acts 10, and let's think certainly of verses 1 uh, through 33. This is the story in narrative form, Acts 10, 1 to 33. And you ought to be asking yourself, what argument is being made here? What's the argument that's being made here by Luke? Well, interestingly, when I look at it, verses 1 to 8, there is vision number 1. There is a vision. I mean, it says as much right there in verse 3, the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw a vision. It's actually a vision that Cornelius has seen. And in one sense, he's told to go send for help. That's all I need to know right now. But the storyteller moves forward, and it moves to a second vision. I'm just talking about the structure of the text. There's a second vision in verses 9 through 16. And this vision comes to Peter. And while Cornelius receives a vision call for help, Peter receives a vision that all things are clean. Twice mentioned there. Verse 10, he's saying, I haven't done anything that's common or unclean. And then the voice comes a second time, two times. I've made all things clean. Do not call them common. Those visions then collide in 17 to 23, where Cornelius and Peter are together, and something happens by way of confirmation for Peter. Look at what he says there in verse 28. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now you're seeing the argument. You have a centurion, uh, a, non, a person not born according to the promises, who's who receives a vision to ask for help. You have one according to the promises who rece receives a vision that all things are clean. The two now meet, and Peter's climactic statement is, God has shown me not to call anything unclean. I guess my question to you is, if that's the way the argument is flowing, or put differently, This is the conversion of Peter to the mission of Jesus. What will be the argument of your sermon? Wrestle that out for a couple minutes with the person next to you. If the text, the argument of the text is giving me the conversion of Peter to the mission of Jesus, How do I recast that for those to whom I speak next Sunday? Or am I simply an expositor because I've told you that this chapter is about the conversion of Peter to the mission of Jesus? Hope you all have a good Sunday afternoon. Go for it. How would you do it? Become Rodin's The Thinker. Anybody? Anybody have? Can anybody state in one sentence the one thing you are out to convince your listener of from this text? Anybody? 
be converted to the mission of Jesus. All right, that's great. Here we see Peter converted to it. I'm out to capture you on the mission of Jesus, which then would have to be something about clean and unclean and acceptable. I think that's the word, who's acceptable. Anything else? Anybody else? What are you out to convince your listener of this week? Okay, so he's, he's indicating he's now discarding the social obstacles that an individual, his goal is to discard the social obstacles in his congregation to what they ought to be on about. Great. His goal is to do what God's told him to do as a congregation, and to go to All right, so he's hitting on this obedience of actually acting in accordance with the word of God that anyone can be acceptable in his sight. Anybody else? Okay, meditate on what's happening here. For what purpose did you say? For the personal mission, yeah. What about in the lens or through the lens of Cornelius? Anybody? Anybody take it that way rather than Peter? I know what's happening to Peter here, but what's the implication of this? What's the implication of this teaching for those who actually had a vision like God might have something for me? Jesus is for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. Yeah. Welcome to church this morning. We have a wonderful story. But I'm out to encourage you. I'm out to encourage you today. Jesus is for everyone. Or you. There's no hindrance to the possibility of you being in relationship to God. I, I know... I know you think there are many hindrances, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden it moves that way. Not blah, 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 but you get it. <laughs> That's moving from text to today in some way. Now let's just look very quickly, three minutes. We don't have time because I want to take some time for questions. I've been asked to do that to stop in five minutes. But now let's look at chapter 11. Chapter 11 is often just indicated as a recapitulation of the argument or the story in chapter 10. Of course, in between, in between Peter's conversion to the mission of Jesus, you do have that story about Cornelius's conversion to the message of Jesus. But now you have this third unit that almost looks identical to the first because it's a retelling. But talk to the person next to you how might this sermon actually be carrying forward a different argument? It opens with criticism from the church in Jerusalem. It moves through the lens of personal experience. It's an experiential message by Peter. And then it moves to an outcome of verse 18, a twofold outcome of silence and glory. Given what you know, because you're all familiar with the story, how might this argument differ than the first? The, the argument of the text is that the church in Jerusalem needed to be converted to the mindset of Jesus. That's the argument of the text. What's the message of your sermon? Give it a run again with the person next to you. And if you're in the middle section, you're at an advantage because neither Mullins nor Moeller can hear you. And so you don't have to worry if you get this right or not, but uh, give it a run.
Anybody? Just a provisional argument. One sentence, I am out to convince my listeners that what from this text? Yep. Uh, the church of God should be focused on the mission of God. That the church of God needs to be focused on the mission of God. And what's the tone of that message for you? How does that tone, what, how's the tone of the text, I mean, what, it, how is it framed in the text? Yeah, there's a there's a a soft corrective in place or hard depend depending on the people you're talking to actually depending upon your audience it's a corrective to the mindset of Jesus whereas chapter 10 in some sense and I'm doing shorthand now chapter 10 could be preached very much under an argument or aim to encourage all of my listeners, there is, there is the possibility for you to be accepted in the eyes of God. We, we, God's word is clear on that. It's for anyone, everyone. The second one, well, for those of you who already have it, there's an element of correction here. Like as in, why are you criticizing? Why, why are you not yet getting this? In fact, that little last verse is fascinating to me, and I'll close with this on this little, uh, these little example texts. When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. I'd love to hear from some of the New Testament prophets here today, but I've really wrestled with what does, I know what that verse says, but what does it mean? The word silent there is very, interesting in Luke 14 4 again Luke is writing this material is used in the sense of they were unconvinced they were not their, their silence was an indication of their refusal is that what's happening here that some fell silent like I'm not on with this but and others glorified God or is it really one group the whole church in Jerusalem was resistant to this but willing to glorify God saying and it sounds like this then well then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance but inside they didn't quite arrive there or was it just really a full orbed I was silent because I was in awe of this now you got to make that call I'm not quite sure how to do it but at any rate you I wanted you to see that two texts that have very similar content might actually have two very different preaching arguments And so it is your task each week to make those decisions for yourself. By way of review, the persuasive preacher must make an argument. An argument is the one thing you're out to convince your listener of from this text, which is different than being able to state, I know the big idea of my text. It's different. And by Friday morning, you better have that. And your preaching will really begin to focus in with, I think, stronger elements of what it is to move your audience, what it is to bring to obedience your audience, if you actually know the argument you're trying to make and the movements in the text that actually would support it. And with that, we come back. To that you're not done with your sermon preparation until you commence this critical work uh, we got a couple of mics from what I understand and we probably have seven or eight minutes if you would like to take issue I'm happy to have you take issue with what I've communicated uh, if you feel that there are areas that we need greater qualification or if you just have questions yes uh, I just have a, a question uh, how, do you feel that the argument of the sermon should be only the main argument of the text? Do you think it's proper 
All right, if, if there's there's a secondary issue in the text, it's not the main it's not the main argument. Uh, just tell me how how you think yeah. about that and how you'd handle that. Yeah, it's really an interesting question. Um, let me just by way of example take you to where where you have to work that out. Take a text like Ephesians two one to ten, which is famous for by grace you have been saved through faith. The grammar of the text and discourse, though, actually provides for me the emphasis of the text. So while you were dead in your sins, and then he goes on and talks about all this stuff, then he does, it waits all the way down to verse 5 before the main clause appears, the subject, but God made us alive. And then later, in order that, he would do something in the future, and in order that, you would not boast. Now that's the argument of the text. The grammar always wins in discourse. There's a million things I can say from Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. I've heard entire sermons about how grace, you've been saved through grace and faith, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. And people lift that verse, and the whole sermon is how grace and faith are the means of salvation. But actually, the main argument of the text, that's not the main argument of the text. That's a sub-indicator within the text. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ignore some of those things, but I want them properly placed within the main argument. So for me, the, the main argument that week has to be something about the connection of, of the main clause and, and, the, and the purpose uh, clauses that come out of it, um, and the conjunctions. You were dead, now you've been made alive. Now you've been seated, now you've been raised. That, my, my sermon's gotta be in that wheelhouse. I'll deal with the famous verse, but it's got to be in relationship to the main argument, if that makes sense. Hey, um, when we're preaching a sermon, can we be making two different arguments in the same sermon, or is that just way too much in 40 minutes? Yeah, so this, this, these are related um, issues, and some of it gets down to what is expository preaching. Um, and in discourse, particularly, let's take Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. You might think that you're going to just, you say something about every line, and somehow I do exposition because I have something to say about everything. It's etymology, it's all of this. I've got three arguments this week. I've got four arguments this week. I don't think that's exposition. I think exposition is the shape and emphasis of the biblical text controls both the shape and emphasis of the sermon I'm giving. And so I, there, might be, there might be four things, and I'm always wrestling with what is the relationship of these things to one another and what is subordinate to what, as opposed to thinking just because I say something about everything, I'm doing exposition. Um, that's my best shorthand answer at this moment. I'd be glad to pick up on it some more because, you know, we've had two comments so far, and they deal with the the thing I'm, I'm trying to argue that it's singular, it's one thing. Um, that's what I'm aiming for. Sir, you said... Uh, DW so, from it, Canada. There it is. Um, you said several times uh, Friday morning's message and having... You, yeah. you better know your point, Friday morning. <laughs> um, having been Saturday morning, right, in life, um, when do you start? Yeah. You don't start Friday morning. No. Um, so no. when, when is it that you start? Yeah, I, I'm doing prep all the time. Uh, but you've got to get going earlier because this is difficult work. I, I am not an advocate for you spend one day, you know, doing your stuff and then the next day writing it. it when you, you can do that, you're going to be as good as your instincts. But I would say that your people are then getting your first and therefore your worst rough draft. And that's, that to me, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not into that. Um, my people deserve better than my first and therefore worst rough draft. So and if, I'm, if I'm not clear by Friday, um, it's going to be a long weekend come Sunday morning. And I, I think there are a lot of guys that they get, they really wait to the end of the week. They wait till Saturday. My word. Heaven help your people. Yeah. You might cover this in a later lecture, but do you put the argument that you're trying to make just right out there in the front? Do you kind of build up to it? Yeah. Or 
because it's like just thinking about a thesis paper, you usually just start and then build it up. So yeah, great question. When do you state your argument? Um, we'll get to that this afternoon on arrangement, but for shorthand, there are times where I make a clear declaration of the argument to be made, and that's one of the functions in arrangement of the exordium or the, the introduction. Um, there are times, though, where I, I let it unfold without stating it. I'm not, I'm not rigid on that. But generally speaking, your audience will be better served if they know what it is you're trying to do. Yeah. Last one. Uh, do you have an opinion on, is our, cult, is our current culture kind of more persuaded through um, like subjective, like rational thought or persuaded more through emotional appeal? Do you have any read on like current culture for that? Yeah, I suppose we're all built differently, right? Um, but certainly at a, at a large generalization, we are um, an evocative and a subjectively moved generation. And I think preachers have tried to mirror that as a means by which they win their audience. Um, I think passion in the pulpit is often one of the biggest problems. Um, not, not, not that, I mean, you gotta be all you, right? But um, I want, I want you say what you say is what Philip Jensen said to me. What you save people by is what you save people to. So if you save them by subjective experiential Christianity, then that's what you save them to, and they will walk out of the Christian faith pretty quick. And if not them, their children will. So yeah, I'm trying to work hard at the logic, the 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 actual rational nature of what it is we're saying. I want you persuaded by that. Yep. Hey, 11 o'clock, you got a lot going on. Uh, see you at four o'clock, bring, bring your mother, we'll have a great time. <laughs>